Amen. You may be seated. Um, so today we're taking a break from uh, our series uh, on the life of Joseph, if you have been part of it. Uh, today we'll be taking a break for one week. I have decided to do something a little bit out of the ordinary. Uh, if you're new to this church, this is usually the time in our service where we dive into Scripture. Uh, we are a Bible-based church. Uh, we love to just hear God's Word. Uh, not pep talk. We just love to just dive in. Uh, and uh, so we just provide expository sermons on God's Word. We believe that we need the Word of God. Without it, we perish. We need words that proceed out of God's mouth. Uh, we shall not live by bread alone. And so we love that. And so today we're doing something a little bit different. Uh, I want to just give an introduction quickly on a few thoughts on Mother's Day and uh, in particular to understanding God's plan and uh, design and uh, possibly just a couple brief things only for a few minutes um, as an introductory element of the, the uh, topic. And then I will open up the stage to four amazing mothers who are going to share some of their testimonies and hopefully you'll be encouraged today. As I was praying and, uh, and thinking about this service, I, uh, and I don't know if you do this or not, every so often I just kind of ponder about where we are as Christians and Christianity in general. And as I'm reflecting, I realize that when Christianity is deeply rooted down in our culture, then the sanctity of marriage is preserved. When Christianity is deeply rooted, biblical manhood is pursued. When Christianity is deeply rooted, the treatment of women is tremendously improved and not self-serving. When Christianity is deeply rooted, godly parenting is fearfully carried out. Parent honoring is wonderfully displayed. That's what happens when Christianity is deeply rooted. And I thought, we're in East County. We're in the Bible Belt of San Diego County. Think about it. We have amazing mega churches in East County. Christianity should be deeply rooted. We should see society being changed and transformed by thousands who call themselves Christians that are going to church every Sunday who are making a difference in their marriages, in their parenting, in their relationships, in their friendships, we should see a culture transformed in this county. And yet, often that's not the case. I think we need to regain a true fear and love for God and His Word and walk in God's commandments and live out a transformed life. So we need Christians, not church goers. We need wretched sinners like me and like you, redeemed by Christ, transformed, so changed from within by the Holy Spirit that you can see it in their lives. You can see it in their marriages, in their relationship, in their being a mother and a father and a child. In how specifically now we honor our parents. We don't need flowers and cards and pictures. We need to display biblical motherhood, fatherhood, biblical parenting, biblical ways to honor our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents to display the work of God in us in ways that are countercultural. Society is doing everything for you to believe that it's about pictures and flowers. We need to bring healing, restoration to the lives around us, to our land, particularly here in East County. So today I want to do it by understanding, obeying God's command. 
it happens that in the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments, we have an amazing command. It is to honor your father and your mother. And we need to regain that. Why? Because I think we lost it. Honoring is down to sending few things. I think mostly because of the brokenness that we, some of us, have experienced. A lot of these kids are now in separate homes and or different homes, going from home to home every weekend. Second marriages, third marriages, fourth marriages. What society is going through, what our culture is going through, parents deciding that they're no longer mom, now they're dad. Now you have two moms, now two dads. A lot of this confusion and disorientation that's happening, it is not helping to honor the parents. So therefore, kids now have a hard time honoring people they don't respect. And I think to some extent we all do that, don't we? Even in, in our jobs, we honor the boss that we respect. We honor the people that walk the walk. They don't just talk the talk. Because talk talks and walk talks. But walk talks louder than talk talks. Wouldn't you agree? In the Old Testament and New Testament, we find a command. Honor, in Deuteronomy 5.16, honor your father and your mother as the Lord, your God, commanded you. Not when it feels like it, not because of your background, but as the Lord commanded you. That your days may be long and it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God has given you. This is in Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. The Apostle Paul writes a letter to Ephesians. He picks up the same thought in Ephesians 6, 1 to 3. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. And now he justifies his point with the same command saying, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. And he's right. The promise is that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. The Bible we find blessings that are specifically, directly related to our obedience. This one is one of them. The promise to have a long, happy, nurturing life in the Lord as we honor our parents. So Solomon writes most of the book of Proverbs. We read the last chapter, which that last section, it wasn't his. But in, in most of the book of Proverbs, Solomon the king writes some amazing things. But there's one in particular. He, he talks about crowns a lot. And he says in Proverbs 12 that an excellent wife, for instance, is the crown of her husband. And then later in Proverbs 16 says, gray hair is a crown of glory. The wisdom that comes with it. In Proverbs 17 says, grandchildren are the crown of the aged. But there's one, the very beginning of Proverbs in chapter 1, 7 to 9. says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. But then he says, hear my son, your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. And then he says, indeed, they are a graceful wreath or crown on your head. Ornaments about your neck. What a beautiful picture that our mother's teaching are a crown on our heads and ornaments on our neck. And you might ask, how, how did Solomon live this out as the king? And I, I have an answer for you that is not my answer. It's from the Bible. There's an amazing text. It's just a verse or two. Solomon understood the importance of honoring his mother and father. And in particular, too, in regards to the mother, understanding that she 
her teaching would be a real crown refined as he honored Bathsheba, his mom. You remember the story of David committing outrageous sin, killing Bathsheba's uh, husband, sleeping with her while Solomon is the son. God's grace all over that story as he repented and confessed the sin. So look at the way that Solomon treats his mother in 1 Kings 2.19. Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak about something in regards to uh, Adonijah. And listen to this. The king rose to meet her and bowed down to her. Then he sat on his throne and had a seat brought for the king's mother. And she sat on his right. The king that honors his own mother. What a great picture, isn't it? Even kings should stoop to honor their mothers. When their mothers enter the room. How amazing. So we understand mothers are responsible to teach the children. As much as fathers are to instruct the children according to God's word. And it might feel hard now. These days, it might feel countercultural. It might feel like you always have everyone against you. But let me just encourage you, mothers and fathers, specifically mothers, your rewards are immeasurable. Not only, God will use what you're investing in your children, in their lives and in their kids' lives. In fact, Paul writes to young Timothy in the New Testament. And tells to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.5, I am mindful of the sincere faith, Timothy, within you, which first dwelt in who? In your grandmother, Lois. And then in your mother, Eunice. And I am sure that is in you as well. And then later on, he's, he tells them, you, however, continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom? You have learned them. That is your mother Eunice and your grandmother Lois. And that from your childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures because your mother and grandmother taught them to you, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. What an encouraging word for all of you mothers today, that your efforts are not in vain. Pastor Sam mentioned the prophet Samuel, Hannah, she prayed for him. She dressed him up for service as a mother. And she also recognized God's calling and ownership over that child. She dedicated him to the Lord. There are some amazing examples in Scripture. I don't have time. I told you I'll be short today. Um, and I lie. That's what pastors do when they say they're going to be short. Uh, <laughs> but you know that. Uh, there are some amazing Examples that you can go home and read. But the power of a mother's love is very evident even outside of the scriptures. Isn't it? The world famous painter Benjamin West said, Mother's kiss made me an artist. St. Augustine, Mother's prayers made me a saint. Abraham Lincoln, all I am or ever hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. But you know, the most amazing example that touched my heart this morning as I was preparing for this moment, I read the most amazing example of honoring and loving a mother on the cross. Jesus crucified on the cross. And in John 19, 26, through the agony and the pain of that moment, Jesus is looking down at Mary. And there's his disciples next to them. Most likely John. And we read, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby. This is Jesus in agony on the last moments on the cross. And he says, woman. Behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, 
behold your mother. Jesus on the cross. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Jesus cared for Mary to the end. And said, behold your mother. From now on, she's in your care. That's how you honor a parent. In the midst of the pain, Jesus is teaching us something so amazing. But we have a work cut out for us to display mothershood, motherhood, God's way today in our culture, as well as honoring our parents the right way. We come out of an era where people are still confused. They do not value women, mothers, the right way. I read an article from the 80s in Focus on the Family that was printed in the 90s. And it feels like today. It's a woman writing, Ann Landers. Not much has changed ever since. She goes, I'm so tired of all those ignorant people who come up to my husband and ask him if his wife has a full-time job or if she's just a housewife. Here's my job description, she says. I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a friend, I'm a confidant, I'm a personal advisor, I'm a lover, I'm a referee, I'm a peacemaker, housekeeper, laundress, chauffeur, interior decorator, gardener, painter, wallpaper, dog groomer, veterinarian, manicurist, barber, seamstress, appointment manager, financial planner, bookkeeper, money manager, personal secretary, teacher, disciplinarian, entertainer. Psychoanalyst. Nur I know you're all going to laugh at that. Nurse. Diagnostician. Public relation expert. Dietitian. Nutritionist. Baker. Chef. Fashion coordinator. Letter writer for both sides of the family. I'm also a travel agent. Speech therapist. Plumber. Automobile maintenance and repair expert. From the studies I've done, I will cost about 75000 a year to replace me. I took time out of my busy day to write this letter, and because there are still ignorant people who believe a housewife is nothing more than a babysitter who sits on her behind all day and looks at soap operas. And I thought, not much has changed since the 80s. As much as this is a reality, I know that God works in miraculous ways in the lives of our women and our mothers. So today I want you to hear straight from them so we'd love to invite uh, Nancy Williams to come up, Susan, uh, and then Stephanie and Gayla, if you guys would join me right now. And I would love to just, for you to hear from them some amazing life stories. And uh, let's welcome them as they come up. Wherever you want. It's Mother's Day, you get to choose. All right. All right, so what I have done is I have just wrote down a couple questions that I thought would be key questions for, for all of us to just hear and, uh, and reflect on. So my first question is, as a Christian mother... What has been the greatest asset at your disposal that made you feel confident in your role as a mother? Who wants to start? Stephanie. <laughs> I will. Thank All right. Is this you should on? Be on. Hello. <laughs> well, I, if people, from, mothers from my era, remember Dr. Spock. <laughs> <laughs> Every, that was the Bible for how to, you know, treat your newborn and how to feed them and all that basic stuff. So I did refer to Dr. Spock's book, and I knew nothing about babies or children. I never even babysat. Um, but the other main source was church. Hmm. I grew up in church. My parents were Christians and uh, such great role models of parenting. Never missed church, Sunday school. Uh, my dad led singing. 
And uh, so it was just a natural thing that when we had Jenny, we, and we were already involved in church, Del Cerro Baptist Church at the time, where Sam was pastor. And uh, so we just, our entire lives revolved around church, church people, um, Bible study, choir, music programs, VBS. So from the day she was old enough to be taken out, she was in Sunday school in church, and she literally grew up uh, with a church family and the support there. One thing that I remember, <clears throat> and my daughter has commented on a lot, at that time in that church, which was a wonderful church, uh, it was so intergenerational. Uh, there were there was a lot of interaction between all age groups. And I think that's a wonderful thing. It is a valuable thing that she felt like she had a lot of grandmas in the church that she could go to. And uh, I remember that she would just call on uh, Kay Jappy or, uh, you know, Gloria Thomas to pray for her. And so it was a family, yeah. and it was very supportive. Good. Good. Thank this you. Is real important. Thank you. Who's going next? Well, <laughs> how much time have you got? <laughs> I would echo the things that Gayla said, and, and mainly the church. I also wanted to say that my husband, Sam, was a great encourager to me about being a mother. Um, I grew up in a home where both of my parents were alcoholics, and I, uh, you know, I felt like in, in many ways, and I was a pretty new Christian, and I was starting from scratch, not just scratch from being a mother, but scratch from being a Christian. And I just cannot ever thank enough all the people who encouraged me in the church that we were going to and the, all of the activities and get-togethers that they offered and just even sometimes watching people, never asking questions, but just watching people and seeing how families interacted was a huge teaching factor in my life. And my um, favorite passage of scripture, which is short, that I memorized when I first became a Christian, is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And it says, to trust the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. No matter where we are, no matter what circumstance we're in, no matter what we don't understand about what's going on right now, if I trusted in the Lord, then he would direct me, and he has. Thank you. Thank you. So. Let's go back to the left. <laughs> okay. Go on. All right. Uh, so... I don't feel worthy being up here. <laughs> I look at my mentors, and I'm just so, so blessed to and honored to be invited here. Um, I grew up in a Catholic church, and um, so my mom took me, and my mom was just an amazing role model. I think as I became a Christian, after I had a couple of children, um, it was really, when I'm in need, I go to God's word, and I need quiet time, I need prayer time. Um, when, when I'm focused on him more and in praising him and talking to him and listening, um, things fall into place. Mm -hmm. And even if it's rough, uh, raising three kids, um, I know that he's got it. I know he loves me and he loves my children. And even though I am not perfect, clearly, um, he, he has my back. And so the more I spend time in his word, I think the more effective I am as a parent. Mm. Yes. That's awesome. Thank you. Such good answers. I don't know if there's anything to say left, but um, to be honest, I think um, I would add on um, what these wonderful ladies have shared in regards to um, the power and the effectiveness of the church body. Um, while I have a really neat, amazing mother um, who just has always had this really neat gift to love, um, especially those that were difficult to love. 
um, very generous. Even if we didn't have anything, my mom would still go find everybody around in our neighborhood that didn't have anything and made sure that they had what they needed. Um, but unfortunately, at the same time, when I was growing up, um, my mother was not a believer. My parents just used church as a babysitting job. Um, but in the midst of that, um, when I was sent to church, God um, really used that and drew me to him. And I remember um, early on actually having a relationship with Christ. And for most of you who don't know, I actually left home when I was 15 um, and while that sounds scary and very rebellious, it was not. Um, it wasn't rebellious at all. In fact, um, I think the Lord had used that opportunity. Um, so while I actually was in high school here, um, my parents decided to move back up north, and I, we'd moved my whole life. Um, every year we were in somewhere different, and I just begged my parents just to let me stay. Um, so they set up some rules for me, and if I could um, keep up with those rules, then um, they would allow me to do it. You know, it was to never have more than one B, always have a job and never need to ask for money, um, and not get into any trouble. And so I really tried to not do any of that. Um, and it was really neat because in the church, God brought other godly women into my life that really invested in my life as a mom and really taught me in different phases that it doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter if you were raised in the church or you weren't. God has a plan for you and he has a plan for you right now. Um, and so I would really say that um, if we have the ability, I think we need to know that we need the church and that moms of all ages need one another um, because you never know how the Lord is gonna use the church body um, to bless you, to encourage you, to equip you, um, to learn from, where to invest in. And then I would add on to what we've shared. I would say um, a great, the greatest asset was the, is, not was, is the power of prayer and the power of God's word. Um, because no matter how hard you try and where you're at in your relationship with the Lord, your children will go through things that you don't want them to go through. They will face the world um, and they have to make decisions on their own as well. And for you as a mom, you're going to feel like you might bomb out. And I tell you, I've spent more time on my knees. Um, even though I have amazing girls, they all have a testimony that they will get to share one day um, that's been really hard. Um, and it was being on my knees to watch God really bring miracles that I knew that I couldn't. Um, so I was really grateful for that and God's word that spoke to me to not waver in teaching my kids God's word because if, if they don't know God's word, they're bound to fail. Even if I don't know if they're listening at that moment, God's word will never go void. And so it does come back and it does bear fruit. And it's such a sweet joy to get to see that in God's timing as well. So, Thank you. Well, you know, so the Bible challenges us to as parents, um, to raise our children, you know, according to the instructions of the Lord and the admonitions of the Lord and all that. So obviously we have that challenge as parents. So as mothers, what would you say were back then or are now some of the uh, maybe weirdest or hardest challenges as a mom to, you know, raise the kids? Like to, I'm thinking, you know, being in this generation almost about to moving to the next, but uh, today's society has its own challenges, but I'm, I'm pretty sure these are n not new to some of you who maybe were a mom of small kids maybe a couple decades ago and still face similar challenges. So I'm just intrigued to ask maybe what would you consider be some of those challenges that could be maybe even encouraging to some of our moms to, to reflect on. The first thing that comes to my mind that's so important, I can't stress it enough, and that is as a mom <clears throat> and parents, um, to really be careful who your kids hang out with, yeah. who their friends are. That's so critical. It was yeah. critical back when we were, you know, raising Jenny, but today, it's even more important because that company corrupts good morals. It does. And now, you know, back then we didn't even have the internet. 
Mm. That changed everything. So you parents of young children that are raising kids today, I just want to encourage you to really monitor their internet access and uh, to, to put them in an environment, church, Christian organizations, whatever you can, to be sure that they have a better chance of having good, wholesome friends. That's awesome. That's great advice. I think I would add on to that. So I'm a mom of three teenagers, um, and I know some, um, actually the rest of the moms um, with me have children that are um, some that are older than even mine. Um, and I would add um, to that as well. Um, I think the greatest challenge is raising our children, yes, in God's word, trying to be the best example um, also in your home, but the reality is, is teaching them to be able to stand firm and walk in the ways that are not of the world, um, because that will be their greatest battle. I think it, it is their. I think it's all of our battle, um, but especially in teenagehood. I'll, I'll, I'll step back a second. When when our children are little, we have this neat, almost control to be able to decide to be intentional to raise them in God's word, to have, you know, family devotions, teach them what's good and what isn't. We get to um, kind of know where they're going, what they're doing. But as they age and they're teenagers, um, you don't have that as much. You still need to be involved. And trust me, you become very creative. Um, <laughs> but the challenge, um, I think, for them is while we teach our, our kids or really try and really pray for them to not feel like they um, are not special or there's something wrong with them when they're not walking in the ways of the world. Um, but we also have to understand that's a very lonely place. And our kids, as they're making life choices to walk in a relationship with Christ, they will, beyond a shadow of a doubt, go through a season where they feel like they're absolutely alone and that the world will be against them. They're going to question it, and it's going to be their own battle. And, and I think that it's, like Gayla was saying, making sure that we open up um, opportunities where they can fellowship with others, um, but also in places that are, are real. I'm talking about the real challenges, um, that none of us are perfect, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, they, they need connections that's going to help balance that season of loneliness, not to be frightened by it, but also to expect um, that God speaks in that isolation as well, um, because the reality is you don't know what you have until God is all you have, you know what I mean? Um, and then they do blossom, but we need to be prepared for, for that as well so that they don't feel like it's just them in the middle of that loneliness. Oh, go ahead, Steph. Okay. Um, balance. So this last year, spending more time at home with the family, I've realized that um, we have to make sure we are taking time for what's most important. And I can think of, you know, parenthood the last 24 years, and we've done a lot of great things. So much joy, so much fun. Um, but sometimes we get busy and, and don't, don't make... Uh, church a priority, or youth group, or Awana, or fellowshipping with other Christians, and uh, I think that's that's what, if I could go back again, I would just make sure I'd balance it, because there's theater, there's sports, there are all these wonderful things to keep kids engaged and growing and learning, um, but we need to be here first. Um, one, uh, this was, I guess, maybe a little bit unique to us, but not entirely one of the greatest challenges um, raising our kids was there came a point where we for both of them um, according to their abilities and things that were going on needed to go to a different school and make a change to a different school mm -hmm. and um, it was actually somewhat upsetting to me that people came to me and we're very um, disgusted with our making a school change for our kids. And uh, didn't ask why, didn't, you know, seek to find answers for it, but just telling 
me especially that we were doing the wrong thing. And uh, I just pray and suggest to people that you have grace over things like that because every parent is responsible for their child's uh, situation at any given time. And both of our kids at particular times in their lives, it was absolutely a godsend that they needed to change schools and did, and that God answered our prayers about where to go. One in particular, um, you know, uh, we knew that we needed to change schools, were asked to go ahead and um, see a child psychiatrist just to, you know, evaluate things. We did that, and then um, I was told to go on a school search. And I did go on a school search, and most of it, Sam and I did on our own. We didn't go talking to all of our friends and asking their opinions because we knew God had promised us, uh, promised us he would give us answers if we just would seek him. And so as I went to different schools and interviewed the principals and stuff, I got a clear no here, a clear no there, a clear no there, a clear no there. And uh, when the final go-ahead came, I went, had talked to this principal at one school. He asked me if I would like to go visit in the classroom for about an hour and see what the teaching was like in there, and I did. And then when he called me back to his office and he said, what did you think? And I, was, I said I was absolutely stunned at the kind of learning that was, and teaching that was taking place in that class. And I said, I just feel like it's the right place for this precious child of mine. And the principal said, well, he said, I feel so bad, but I have to tell you we don't have an opening now. And she can't, whoops, uh, come. <laughs> and so, you know, I went home that afternoon encouraged but also brokenhearted. The next morning, my phone rang at 7.30 in the morning and it was that principal. And he said, Nancy, he said, I thought about you all night long and I'm making a space for your child. Oh. And that was such a huge answer to prayer. But people were critical of us for making that choice. Yeah. And uh, I didn't feel like, and no parent should have to do this to explain to the world about the decisions that they're making for their child. Mm -hmm. So, love you all out there. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So when we were talking about assets, you know, your disposal, uh, many of you answered the church being just an environment that God had used to provide some of those assets as you were starting to be a mother or even for your kids, you know, to relate to. Um, so I was wondering what more because maybe that's not the story for many of us here today. Maybe not all of us had that kind of an experience in regards to yeah. being in that kind of a church environment. Um, what could the church have done more to be a blessing to you in your role specifically as a mother? That could be maybe a lesson for us here today. I'll go first. I'll be short and sweet. I couldn't think of anything. I've really felt supported throughout the years. That's awesome. That's great. Um, yeah, I did too. Del Cerro had so much going for kids, youth group. And, and I want to add that we didn't just send her. We were both teaching Sunday school of uh, VBS. We were mm -hmm. in the choir. We were so involved. And uh, parents need to do that. You know, that's, mm -hmm. I know that you just kind of were in a different situation and you benefited from it. But if you can... Get involved. Like Kurt uh, said earlier, he used to be on the sidelines. But wow, what a difference when you get involved and get in the trenches. And, get, and your kid, your child sees that. They watch everything you do. And it's not, you know, teaching them is one thing. But living it is the real teaching moment for them. What they see you do. And if it matches up what, how you are at home when you're in public, they never forget that. And that yes. becomes their default when they go out on their own. Oh, that's great. That's great. 
Um, it's interesting that you mentioned that because it was different when I, when I was younger and even became a younger mom. But um, what I would add, um, because I think as a side note, um, what a joy for me to be able to, to share is I did not grow up in a Christian home. But my parents became believers, and my parents became rock star believers, but well into their older age. Um, and it wasn't until I was much older that my mom um, truly gave her life to the Lord. My mom is one of those prayerful grandmothers um, that I'm so grateful for. And I think that the people in the church that invested in me helped me to grow. And in my life, my parents got to see, I come from a family of seven children, um, and my parents got to see what God was doing in my life, which affected them and led them to the Lord. Um, so I love that. But what I would share is when I was a young mom, um, while I was really blessed to have these individual ladies um, that spoke into my life growing up, um, when you, I, I think even for us um, as parents, when we are dealing with our kids, um, and even for us, when you're a mom of little ones, um, when you go from going to school, getting a degree, you're going to be something when you grow up, um, we want to feel like we are accomplished, we are successful. And when you become a mother, especially of little ones, um, it is likely that you will go through a season where you feel like you're losing your identity. Because all of a sudden, you went from being able to control all of your choices to making all of your plans around everyone else and you were the last one on the list. And, I mean, right? <laughs> and at first you feel like it's not a death sentence, that's a little extravagant, but it, it, it is a little bit of a battle. And, and I wished that I had been a part of, at the time, a church that invested in different ages of mothers not just the kids, but the mothers. Like, if I had had a woman at that point in my life to tell me this is a season and seasons change, and seasons have a lot of incredible beauties, but they also end, and you don't know that you're going to treasure these times, um, there's something really sweet in that. Um, and then the other would be able to say is you as a mom need to know that seasons do change. You will get through it. We need to love on these young moms. But we also need to encourage moms that motherhood doesn't mean that life stops either. We need to be a part of the church. We need to find somewhere to serve. Um, we need to be served because we don't stop being a part of the body either. And the body needs to be fed and encouraged um, and I think sometimes we feel like we're bad moms if we give up watching or being involved or doing something for our kids or making sure that they're in bed at 7.30, you know, on a Wednesday night when you could be at a Bible study that the Lord could be ministering to because you just don't know what God has for you that then benefits your motherhood as well. Mm -hmm. So I think kind of the, that combo of discipleship on both sides, if yeah. that makes any oh, sense. That's a great point. I just uh, would echo the things that have been said to her and, and to just be involved and have that Kurt Hurd mentality <laughs> and for all of us to be very involved in all the activities, especially as they relate to our family size and, and the ages of our children and everything so that we are encouraging, supporting each other and also learning truths about ourselves. You know, there were a lot of times, have been a lot of times at church where I discovered a truth about myself that I didn't like all that much. And it wasn't because a person came up and said something to me, but it was because God said something to me in a moment that I was there. And I needed to con go home, confess it, and get started on the right path from that uh, with him. So thank you for all you do to make church a family. Amen. Well, you know, being a mom is an adventure. <laughs> okay. And I think you guys have some funny, funny stories that maybe you want to share. At least one funny story or moment as a mom with all of us. And if your kids are here, you're welcome to embarrass them. We, we're okay with that. Only one? At least one. Why don't we start with one? <laughs> Which one do I tell? <laughs> oh, I got to tell this one. It's so funny. 
when our kids were, uh, we did this kind of thing. We hoped to every year for several years. We went to Lake Powell and with some friends. And at the time, we had owned a trailer. And we also had owned the oldest boat left in San Diego. Um, <laughs> And we tried to water ski by the, uh, you know, in back of that and had a great time. But we went with friends. And uh, this particular time, we decided to rent a big houseboat. And there were 11 of us on that houseboat. And we had the meals all planned. We had, you know, we did water skiing. We were diving in the water. We jumped off cliffs, you know, and all those same things that you do. And... Uh, played baseball in the sand, et cetera. So we'd had our whole full day, done our campfire. It was nighttime. We went to bed. And Sam and I slept in the kitchen area on the sofa seating area by the dining. You know, we wanted to stay close to the food. And then <laughs> <laughs> we had kids sleeping on top of the houseboat, which was a lot of fun. And, um, and then some other adults there. And again, uh, there were 11 people of us. And Sam and I woke up at about 2 o'clock in the morning. We started hearing this. <laughs> and we tried to figure out what in the world it was. And we, we kind of walked around and kind of looked at everybody that was asleep and nobody was snoring or making weird noises in the night. So we went back to our beds and we had been there for another five minutes or so and we heard this <laughs> and we finally decided there must be something in the cupboards that we didn't know about. So... Sam and I got up with our flashlights and we started looking and all of a sudden uh, this other couple that was on the boat with us, they came out because they heard some noise and we explained to them the sound that we were hearing and we didn't hear it anymore after they came in the room. And we had also turned on some lights so we decided, okay, we're going to turn off some lights and we're going to sit here quietly and see if the sound resumes. And sure enough. <laughs> and ultimately, all of us were in there looking for whatever it was. And we discovered there was a rat in our cupboards on the houseboat. We have no idea how it got there, but we know how it left there. <laughs> and uh, suffice it to say that rats do not swim uh, underwater for any length of time. And Sam is a wonderful assistant. If you need help with a rat at your house, he does drownings quite well. And uh, not only did we drown the rat, but we kept it for a ceremony the next day. <laughs> and we had a very fun but very loving ceremony to say goodbye to Herbert the Rat, who went to rat heaven. And we just have laughed about that for years. Uh, that's fun. Sorry I took so that's long, fun. but it was so fun. <laughs> that's fun. Well, Anybody uh, the, else? Yeah, mine's shorter, but it, uh, we were married eight years before Jenny came along. So we were kind of set in our ways, not used to having oh, no, a child. You weren't. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, when she was old enough finally to, you know, go to Sunday school, uh, we went in separate cars because I was in the choir and he was teaching Sunday school. And so we both got home from church and <laughs> neither one of us remembered to pick up Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I said, well, didn't you pick her up? No, I thought you did. Oh, my goodness. So we drove all the way back to church, and poor Sunday school teacher was waiting there with our baby, and, you know, we, we got kidded a lot. I think it was Sharon Voltmer that was the one that was stayed there with Jenny. Anyway, we learned a good lesson that, you know, we got to check who's picking up the kid. 
<laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome. It is hard to figure out which ones you share because um, there's so many of them. And the more kids you have in your family, the more stories you have. Um, one thing that I really love about our children is that they're so different from one another. I mean, in every way, shape, and form. The way that they look, the way that they act, their character. And yes, I have teenagers, so I have to be very choosy on what I share because <laughs> they will hang it over my head for a very long time. <laughs> but you know what I love is um, how impressionable they are um, and that they are sponges and how you really, really should be careful um, of what you say in front of them, how they compute and um, interpret your stories or your commands or your instruction or lessons or whatever it is. Um, and we've had a couple little things, um, like when Joya was little, she was about four, five years old, um, and I would be running all over the place, and I'm like, okay, it's time to go to bed, and um, we've got to get some stuff done, and you know, me, one of those young moms that needed everything in order before something could happen, you know, um, and Joya, she would be like, don't you worry, mom, I will help Eva with devotion, so she'd get up onto our brick orange couch, yes, it was brick orange, but it made sense in the house, um, and she would get Eva up there with a little book, and she'd pretend that she could read, and she would sit there and, and do her devotion and tell her little sister all about Jesus, and then she would look at her, and she would tell her, and if you don't listen to these things, you might go to hell. <laughs> and Eva was like, oh. <laughs> well, it was because we'd have to go back, and we'd have to kind of explain a little bit more. Um, but then there was another really funny, sweet, sweet time um, some of you may know, but when our kids were little, unfortunately, we had um, an experience with um, a pretty brutal break-in to our home, and our whole family had been involved in this, um, this situation. And so obviously, with a break-in, you deal with trauma, and it lasts a, a long while. Well, our home at the time was broken into three levels. Um, so you had the bedrooms on the top floor, you had the main floor, and then underneath you had what we called a, a tavern, but you would consider it probably like a basement. And underneath, um, downstairs, it had a fireplace. And so um, Grace was seven and Joya was five. And Joya had lost her first tooth. And you just thought this was the greatest thing ever because she wanted to lose teeth because every time Grace lost teeth, she would get prizes and money. And she's like, yeah, this is my turn. And Grace, like, she was excited for her, but she, Grace was also very nervous. She's like, well, come, come with me. because, And I, I, I was far away. I wasn't really understanding what was going on and what kind of a concoction of a story they were, you know, what, what, what were they creating? And so they run downstairs in their little onesie jammies, um, you know, the things that we wish we could go back and watch them do. Um, and Grace is helping her little sister write this letter to the fairy tooth, um, well, to the tooth fairy, but she called her Princess Fairy Tooth Fairy. And so she, she wrote out this letter and she said, well, it's gonna be really difficult for the tooth fairy to get into the house, so let's come up with a plan. And so, and I still didn't understand. And so the girls had gone to bed and later that night I had gone downstairs and I see this beautiful letter written by this first grader sitting in the middle of my fireplace <laughs> underneath, directly under the chimney. And Grace says, Joya, I got you. You won't get forgotten. And, and I'm like, what is she talking about? So um, I go downstairs and I see this letter and Grace had written this letter for Joy and it says, dear, beautiful, wonderful, generous tooth fairy, could you just drop a bigger present from the chimney? Because you might set off the alarms. <laughs> So it, just the little thoughtfulness of the girls together was so funny. And I do have to share one more, and she would kill me if I had a picture. But when I would tell Eva, Eva, it's time for you to pick up your stuff. You know, no matter what age, you want to expect to teach them something. Um, and Eva is quick and precise, but she likes a shortcut. And she couldn't have been older than two um, maybe not even that old. And I said, I'm going to go finish the dishes. You need to pick up your toys. She looks around that there's not a basket. I said, figure out what you need to do. And so I go into the kitchen. I come back in, and she looks up, and she had stuffed all of her toys in her onesie. <laughs> it was just, just full. And I just thought, 
Well, you came up with a solution. You'll definitely be a problem solver. Right. So don't underestimate the minds of your children. <laughs> That's right. Okay, I have three quick ones, one for each of my kiddos. Um, first one, four years ago, um, I had injured my other knee, and I was in a brace, and it was my little guy's, I don't know, eighth birthday, and um, he got a trip from his grandfather to spend the night on the Midway, the USS Midway, and do a tour. And of course, a parent had to attend. So I got to go, and it was probably a week after I was injured. I could barely walk off crutches. And I got to spend the night on the Midway, going up and down all the steps, all the ladders, and going through these little, they weren't portholes, but they were about two feet wide, and you had to crawl through them. And it was hilarious to me. He was probably probably oblivious how difficult it was for me, but it's just such a fun memory because I'm thinking this is ridiculous. That it was a, it was a great time. Um, my oldest was very competitive at baseball, and he was ten and a half when my youngest was born, and he was in the All Stars, and um, Luke was due in July, and All Stars were in May June, and my son wanted to make sure he could pitch well and he could catch well. So here I am at eight months pregnant, throwing on catcher's gear, <laughs> kind of hiding behind, I don't know if it was a trash can or something, and in the gear and catching for him so he could pitch to me. And then likewise, so that he could practice batting, we'd set up trash, we'd, we'd, my son reminded me, we'd jump over the fence at Little League, we'd set up trash cans at, at the pitcher's mound, and I would throw at him and then duck, and it was, it was just, it was just the, the most ridiculous memory ever, but um, it's all good times. Uh, and then my last, my daughter, um, she is spunky, fiery, determined, and when she was about three, we were at the playground, and she had climbed up this metal structure. It wasn't too high, but, you know, the mom and me said, remember, use both hands while you're climbing, and she got to the top, and there, I don't know exactly what it was, but there were some other kids nearby. And so my daughter uh, took both hands off, you know, did the little sticking, oh. sticking your hands out, or, you know, making fun or having fun with some of the girls, and then plunk, fell right down, hit her chin on the bar going down, and, and split it. Uh, so she cried for about 30 seconds. We drove to the hospital down the hill, and at the ER, she proceeded to lay there, laugh, she would laugh. She was sticking out her tongue at the guy that was gluing her chin together. She was just having the most fun. And that's pretty much Becca's personality <laughs> today. So one all for right. each of my kiddos. Thank you. Well, thank you all for sharing. Why don't we close with, I'll give you 30 seconds each, um, one piece of biblical wisdom that you maybe want to share with us all as we close this moment. Maybe a verse that stuck with you as a mom. Or just a piece of biblical wisdom that you feel like I will share this with everybody. This would be key. I already said, you know, my favorite set of verses. But one of the other things, other than, uh, you know, just first of all, and this is not new, but to seek God. And one of the best ways that I did that was not only to study the Bible, but I poured through the book called Boundaries that was written a number of years ago by Cloud and Townsend, and there have been some updates on it. And it's an amazing book where you can study about when to say yes, when to say mo no, maybe later, whatever you might do, and how you draw loving, godly, healthy boundaries between yourself, your child, and other people, and then you know, to carry that wisdom with you and grow in strength. And it just has served me in so many amazing ways. And I not only studied it for myself to begin with, but have done uh, several groups where we do the study together. Thank you. Absolutely amazing. Thank you. I think um, I would um, go back to some of the principles that we shared before um, by being a woman of prayer um, for our kids. Um, but you really have to be able to have a... a a growing relationship with the Lord yourself to be able to depart that to your children um, and to be able to teach them God's word. But in a practical way, it's important that we teach them what God thinks and, and what God commands and what he desires from us and the consequences that come when we don't obey. 
Well, God is not a, a God that sits in heaven with his finger down judging, as some people might have this image. He's actually our heavenly father that blesses, wants the best. So the way that we feel about our kids, our undying love, we would give our life for our children. Um, we want the absolute best in the world for them. He feels stronger in all of those ways for our children. But sometimes I think as parents, um, the older they get, we want to be their friend more than we want to be their parent. And sometimes it's really hard to be the parent um, and not their friend um, at the time because they'll have a lot of friends, but they usually only have one mom, one dad in that situation. And if we can't teach our children to obey us, then we cannot expect them to obey God. And the consequences to that, I think, are, are much more severe. So I think it's important to know that you can be their friend, but be their parent first. And God gives us the ability and the wisdom to know what that looks like. And if we just trust the Lord, as Tran um, Nancy was sharing, you know, through Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, um, if we're being obedient to the Lord in our position as a mom, the fruit will come later on in the lives of our children and we'll be grateful. And it's not always easy. We probably will shed a lot of tears and cry out to the Lord, but the fight and the battle will be worth it because we will know that we aren't the ones ushering our children into hell, but we are the ones that are leading them to the Heavenly Father. And so it's worth the fight. Thank you. Ladies? Well, there's so much bad news out there in the world. That's what they're bombarded with constantly. And uh, I like to think about the joy of the Lord is my strength. Mm -hmm. And joy is what's uniquely found in the body of Christ, in Christians, in the Christian community. It's very unique. And uh, so as a parent, as a mom, I always uh, laughed a lot with Jenny, we, I love a sense of humor, and I think God has a sense of humor. He better, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> or we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. But I think that the joy of the Lord, uh, when you see that in, in your mm -hmm. church family, and you can laugh together and uh, let things roll off your back, I think that's important as a parent and as a mom and as a Christian. And so when you come in the doors of the church, there should be a lot of happy, smiling faces and joy. And that's what I really cherish and I hope passed on to, to Jenny. Mm -hmm. Steph. So uh, Matthew 1820 says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Uh, spend time with mama believers. Spend time at church. Spend time at VBS, youth group. Um, the beach, anywhere with them. Go to Bible study with mama believers. And they don't have to be people your age. My first Bible study, I was the baby. And I think I was 30, at least 35 at the time. I was the youngest there. And there was so much wisdom in that Bible study. I learned immensely um, about Jesus and about his love for us and about what I can do as a mom. All right. Well, thank you. We have a gift. For you four, if uh, do we have Kurt and Chris? All right, let's give it up for our guests. Thank you, ladies. Here we go. You are a blessing to us and our church. We just want to honor you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, let me tell you this. We have a gift for the mother of the youngest child among us. So if your child is a year old or younger, would you stand with us this morning? A year old or younger? Okay, all right, a year old or younger, okay. If your child is nine months old or younger, would you remain standing? I can't, can you guys help me out because I can't see with these lights. What do we have, two? One and one. All right. If your child is six months old or, or younger, would you stay standing? All right. What about four months old or younger? Ooh, it's a close call. Three months old or younger? Four months next week?
I am lost with the math. Okay, so who is the winner? <laughs> By two days? By three days. All right, let's give it up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so now we have another gift for the mother of the most kids. So if you have three or more children, would you stand? Three or more children. Kevin, thank you for standing in the gap. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> All right, so if you are a mother of four or more children, would you remain standing? All right, if you are a mother of five or more children, would you remain standing? We lost them all? No. We have a winner, Cynthia. All right. God bless you, Cynthia. All right. Okay. So now I have a gift for the mother with the most grandkids. So if you have three or more grandchildren, would you stand? All right. If you have four or more grandchildren, would you remain standing? Five grandchildren or more. Six, God bless you. Six grandchildren or more. All right. Not even a close call. Okay. Seven grandchildren or more. Wow. Eight or more. Wow. Okay. Nine grandchildren or more. Wow. Okay. Ten grandchildren or more. Whew. Eleven. Or more? Still, still 11? Okay, so 12 ch grandchildren or more? Linda. God bless you, Linda. 12. Can you tell us how many in all? How many? 12. All right, God bless you. Okay, and now we have one special gift for the oldest mother in the room without embarrassing anybody if you are a mom and you are 75 or older we would love to honor you this morning would you stand if you are a grandmother and you are 80 years old or older would you remain standing if you are 83 or older no we lost them all we did it. We did it. We have a winner. All right. May God bless you. God bless you. Okay. And now we have a gift for all the moms. So if you're a mother this morning, would you stand? And we have some amazing gifts that all of our ladies have prepared. We want to bless you. We want to honor you as a mother. We want to encourage you that things are going to be okay, that God is with you. He's given us everything we need to accomplish our tasks as parents and uh, for you as mothers. And uh, you are a blessing to our church, to our family. And we hope you take on the baton to be a blessing to others, even connecting here at church in ways that can be impactful uh, in the lives of many of our children and grandchildren that are going to look up to you. So we want to honor you this morning. Uh, you may remain standing if you have not received your gift yet, or you may sit down if you have. So that way the ushers can help us out. All right. And what I would like to do is to ask everyone to stand and have a standing ovation for all of our mothers this morning. All right. We want to honor you. We want to bless you. We want to share how much we appreciate you from the bottom of our hearts. All right. Let me just pray for all of you mothers this morning. Father, we thank you for the gift that moms are. They are your gift. We thank you that family is your idea. Father, you have created family. You have created marriage, the union of a man and a woman according to a covenant that we are to display of this unconditional love for one another. We thank you the gift of motherhood that you have given us. Thank you for the fact that many of us have come to faith because of faithful Christian mothers. Father, we pray that they will continue to be a blessing, even not with their own kids and grandkids, but many other spiritual children along their journey, that they will be a blessing in that. Father, and I pray for strength for all of our moms, for blessings in their lives, that they would honor their families with the gifts, the talents, the treasures you've given them. 
Father, we thank you, and we thank you that you are our God and our Savior. And we thank you that all of this is our way to honor what you've asked us to do, which is to honor our fathers and mothers. We say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.